Okay, I've got uh, my watch says three o'clock. Let's go ahead and um, call the February 22nd, 2021 water board meeting to order. Um, Heather, can you start with the roll call? Sure. Uh, Todd Williams? Here. Allison Gould? Here. Kathy Peterson? Here. Um, Scott Holwick? Here. Roger Lang? Here. Ken Hewson? Here. Nelson Tipton? Here. Wes Lowry? Here. Kevin Bowden? Here. Heather McIntyre is here. Jason Elkins? Here. And Council Member Martin is just coming in. So, Chair, we have a quorum. Okay. Thank you, Heather. Um, next item is the approval of the previous month's minutes. Whereas does anybody have any questions, comments on the meeting minutes? If not, we need a, a motion to approve the January 25th, 2021 meeting minutes. So moved. Roger with the motion. Is there a second? Second. Kathy. All right, Kathy did the second. Any further comments? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, meeting minutes are approved. Um, next item, item four is the water status report, Nelson. Yeah, Todd, thank you. I'll go ahead and do that. Um, so not a whole lot to give, pretty, pretty uh, similar in uh, the winter months, um, but I'll do the standard stuff. So the flow of the St. Brand Creek at Lyons at 7 a.m. today was 7.68 CFS. Um, the 124 year historic average is 14.25 CFS for this date. The call on the St. Brain Creek is Highland Lake. Um, admin number is um, 8917 with a priority date of 531-1874. The call on the main stem of the South Platte that's uh, impacting District 5 is uh, Pruitt Reservoir which is admin number 22059 with a priority date of 525-1910. Uh, um, Ralph Price Reservoir at, um, Ralph, um, at uh, Button Rock Reserve is currently full and spilling uh, due to the uh, outlet repairs that are planned for that. And those repairs are anticipated to be completed uh, sometime in March of next month. And uh, Jason can go into more detail if he wants to, but uh, I'm not sure if he's um, he is working on, Jason Elkins is currently working on that, uh, on that project. Um, Union Reservoir is at 19.4 feet, which uh, 28 feet is uh, full. So it's down at approximately 5,500 acre feet and currently releasing 9.5 CMS. Uh, so for today, snowpack, I just looked it up before we, um, I, I got on. The South Platte Basin is currently at 92% of normal. And the upper, upper Colorado is currently at 88%. And uh, Wes will we'll go into more detail on the um, drought in uh, um, water supply update. That's all I have, Todd. Okay, thanks, Nelson. Does anybody have any questions, comments for Nelson? Roger? Uh, Nelson, how often do they uh, measure the snowpack? How often? M monthly oh, wow. well you know the physical I, you know ken and west can chime in but the physical readings i think are done monthly they actually physically go out there or they, they they take their snowmobiles out there and they're snowshoeing out there and they take the snow sample that way i think that's done monthly and then and then they have reporting they have actual snow information sites that electronically are giving them the reading. And that's how they update it on more of like every few days. Is that correct, right. Weston, Ken? That's correct. But that that number then you just gave us for snowpack, then that's as of what, just a few days ago? As of today, as of this morning. Oh, oh really, okay. Well, when I first, actually this afternoon, when I first pulled it up this morning, I think Wes also helped with it. It, it was at, it was 1% less for each one of the sites. And since with our current, our just our, that last snowstorm that we had, it it raised it up a percent. Okay. 
Okay, for, thank you. For each, for each basin, uh, the South Platte and the Colorado Bulls were increased 1% from, from this morning, actually. All right, thanks. Any other questions of Nelson? All right, I'm not seeing any. Um, with that, we'll we'll keep moving on. Item five is public invited to be heard in special presentations. Heather was there um, as of before the meeting. There was no public invited to be heard. Is that still the case? That's correct. We don't have anyone today. Okay, and no special presentations. We have none. Okay, great. Thank you, Ken. Um, any item six? Any agenda revisions or submission of documents? We have none. Okay. Item seven, development activity. Um, there is, um, in my right, there's no development activity for consideration today. That's correct. None for this month. I believe we'll have a couple for next month. Okay. Thanks, Wes. Moving right along, 8A is um, an agreement between the City of Longmont, East Tree Creek Water District, Rapo County Water Authority, and United Water. Um, a water exchange agreement. Um, Nelson, are you taking this one? Yeah, I'll, I'll take this one. So, um, so as you indicated, uh, Todd, the uh, item in front of the water board is the, it's, we've been doing it annually for the last uh, five years. We started back in, well, several years. Back in 2015 is when we started the first one. And uh, it's a raw water exchange agreement between East Cherry Creek, um, Arapaho Water, I'm abbreviating in United Water. And um, so it's, it's considered an IGA. Um, and a water board action would be review and make a recommendation to city council. And it's uh, uh, scheduled for city council on March 30th of 2021. We got a regular session for that night. So I included in your packet a copy of the uh, and I'm just going to call it IGA, a copy of the IGA, and then also the resolution. We actually had that completed through city, through the city attorney's office already, so that's good. Um, so, let's see. So, um, under the existing municipal code, raw water supplies with other governmental agencies and special districts are uh, considered um, intergovernmental agreements, IGAs. Um, so the basis of the IGA is to exchange water, water of uh, equal value, so water for water. And uh, East Cherry Creek, Arapaho, and United will use its uh, fully consumable um, decreed water to meet Longmont's um, Union Reservoir change case. It's 87 CW222, and it's the Bijou ditch loss component that they're going to meet. And, and typically the ditch loss is uh, due in July and August of each year. So it'll be July of 20, 2021 and August of 2021. <clears throat> and then Longmont will use its uh, fully decreed uh, water to meet um, East Cherry Creek, Arapaho and United's uh, winter uh, re return, well, actually winter replacement obligations. And typically that's period we, um, from October to March 31st. So it'll be October of this year, 2021 to March of 2022. And so, um, so actually for this year, since it is so dry, I wanted to make a comment that uh, hopefully we can get some water underneath Union Reservoir's decree. So it, it, we have to store actual um, Union Reservoir decree water and then to generate um, a replacement obligation, which which the Bijou ditch loss is a component of it. We have, there's two components, the return flow obligation and then the ditch loss component. So, um, and, and during actual, the last couple of years, it's been pretty dry come July and August. And so in order to um, help us get Longmont's um, ditch loss for the Bijou down there. So we've been, they actually can get it easier. They don't have to go travel it all the way down through the South Platte to get to uh, Bijou Headgate. Drop it in through their decrees, decree water rights right there at Lower Latham's um, measurement. And so that helps out a lot. So so this year, if it continues to be dry, that'll be that'll be helpful for us. But it's been working out really well and they, they provide a schedule for, for Longmont um, to make for, for their 
for their obligations. They provide it well in advance and uh, they, they lay it out. And if they have any changes, they notify us. So they've been, they've been a good client to work with. So that's, is there any questions on just the basis of how it works? So it is water for water. Any questions, Allison? Yeah, Allison, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Nelson. Um, how much water has been exchanged over the course of this agreement? So as I indicated, it, it's different every year. So it's all based on how much we actually, in the, in the LAWMOTS account. So there's several different individual shareholders that have individual accounts. LAWMOTS one of them. We, we are the, the larger, the larger uh, um, space in that, in, in Union Reservoir. And so each year it, it varies of how much we actually get of that senior decree in there. That generates the replacement obligations. And, and, but we maxed it out. So we go up to 600 acre feet um, because that, we haven't seen the ditch loss for just, and this is just Bijou. There's, there's also um, return flows for uh, Union, Lower Latham and Bijou. There's three entities that, that are um, part of the eight W222. So does that answer your question, Allison? So um, it varies year to year. Oh, okay. So is it 600 every year? Well, it's up to, it's up to. So it can, it can be, it can be, uh, you know, a couple hundred acre feet to, you know, 500 acre feet, but we, we, we put 600 so it doesn't exceed that. And then if, if they need additional water from us, then they'll, if they request over and above the 600, we have to approve that if we want to do that and vice versa for Longmont, if we need over 600 acre feet. But right now we have it up to 600 acre feet. Because yeah. you're kind of you're kind of actually uh, guessing. You're kind of trying to project. You don't know what it's going to be until because the, the storage period, Allison, actually ends on June thirtieth. So we can we have the ability to store all the way up into June thirtieth, and then we generate the uh, replacement obligation. Generates Bijou's ditch law. And sorry, Ken, go ahead. Didn't mean to cut you off. Yeah, uh, Allison, if I could just add real briefly. Really, the the amount that is exchanged is based upon how much water we can store under the Union decree for our purposes. Once we've stored that water in Union Reservoir, it generates that obligation to everywhere, but in particular, the one that's of interest to us is the Bijou Ditch. So a good example would be, to, you know, we, we store and generate a 200 acre foot obligation to the Bijou Ditch, we have to get that water down to them. In a year like this, it's very difficult to do that. So this gives, this gives us the opportunity to have that water delivered right above the Bijou Ditch. In fact, literally the water um, that they are delivering has to go past the Bijou Headgate. Um, they have to send it down to a senior appropriator. So it allows them to divert it and then in exchange, we have water up here that we can deliver quite easily. So it's really a win-win for both of us. But, but yeah, the short answer is usually it's around two to 300 acre feet, um, four to 500 when we store a lot of water in, in Union. And, and we certainly are hoping we're storing at least 5,000 acre feet in Union <laughs> this year because we're down that far. So um, it'll be a little bit bigger this year because of how much we need to store this year. Uh, the two benefits we have to remember. One is the water that we have to get down to the Bijou Headgate. That's mostly important to us. That happens. The second is we're not having to release this water in the summer when we normally would have to release it in June and July. Instead, we're releasing it the next winter. So our recreational program at Union Reservoir benefits from higher water levels in the summer. And then we release in the winter. And if I may, one follow-up question. Uh, I was just wondering yes. kind of what uh, the figures looked like as far as transit losses saved. So, so typically, I don't have the the, the numbers off top of top of my head, but I'll, I'll explain some one thing before we we did this agreement back in you know prior to 2015. So, we'd have to kind of work with the state, and we would slug it, and then they charge you know a half percent per mile. And um, I'd have to pull up the dec decree to get an exact um, how many miles it is, but I think it's I think it's um, I think it's 35 total to get to the Bijou. But don't don't quote me on that. But I think I'm close. I think it's 35 miles. I'll get all the way down to the Bijou Headgate. 
and a half percent per, per mile. That's that's quite a bit. And then we have to slug it in order. You know, you have to get it with. In order to get it down there, you can have to slug it. So we let it out of Union at a pretty high a high amount. So you, you add that that transit loss to it. And then, so you go, like Ken said, say you're using 200, 300 acre feet, then you're adding it to that amount. So you can, you're definitely saving a good, good percent. It's, it's helpful. And plus the coordination alone is, is quite, uh, is quite the effort. Um, you you got to work with the other ditch companies and especially Bijou and the state and to get that all, all organized. And then also Union Reservoir Company itself to make that release. So it, it's very helpful. And, any other questions for Nelson on the proposed agreement? If not, we need a, I guess the um, recommendation would be um, from the water board to the city council to approve the IGA. Yeah, correct. Does, does someone want to make that motion? Mr. Chair, I'd make that motion, this is Scott. Okay, Scott Holwick made the motion is there a second? I'll second. Okay, Kathy seconded the, the motion. Um, any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, motion carries. Right. Thanks everyone, appreciate it. Thanks Nelson. All right, we're on to the items from the staff. The first is 9A, which is a when you get firming project update, Ken. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, just a fairly brief update this month. Um, I think all the water board uh, is aware that um, there was an appeal filed for the federal um, case against the permit issuance. And so we're, we're off on that. Uh, Typically those appeals take around a year, but uh, it could be a little less or it could be a lot more. <laughs> we, yeah, you know, the, there's, there's no telling, especially with, with the courts uh, uh, operating a little bit more remotely uh, as well. But uh, we certainly hope um, that, it, the, the, sooner than later, that that'll get done. Uh, the, re the result of that action is that um, both Longmont was prepared and ready to start the process of selling bonds, as well as the um, project participants who were doing um, a pooled bond were ready to, to start that. Both of those processes, of course, have um, uh, stopped. The pooled, the pooled financing proponents are still preparing their official statement. Um, I know how much work it takes for Longmont to put an official statement together. <laughs> so uh, it's, it's almost staggering what it takes that many participants to get that big of an official statement together. So that will continue. It's expected that um, it, you know, it won't happen quite as fast, but it, it's expected that will continue in the next three or four months to try to get that official statement and get ready to issue that bond. Um, then, then the participants, um, project participants will have to decide, you know, what do we do? Do we go forward? Uh, you know, the most likely we will not be going forward until the end of the appeal period. Technically the project can start and, and, and can move forward. Um, because the, there was not a motion to enjoin the project from being constructed, um, just a motion uh, to appeal some of the uh, ruling on the, uh, on the permit. So the permit is valid um, and there is some, some small um, preparatory work going on. An example is the, getting the electricity into the construction site um, from the local provider, which is Poudre Valley REA, that works ongoing because you got to have that. Um, the U.S., um, um, the uh, United States WAPA, Western Area Power Administration, one of the first things that needed to happen, they, their main transmission line, 
that generate that, that delivers power from the CVT um, system down south, including Too Long Mutt, goes right through the middle of the Chimney Hollow Valley. Um, so that that power line needs to be relocated. Um, after the permit was issued and the ruling in favor of the permit, um, the WAPA was ready to go. And so they've already, they, they launched right away and, and started the relocation of those power poles. Um, that work is continuing and I would expect to be done fairly soon. Uh, so hopefully, hopefully th th that's positive. That'll be out of the way. So when, when the project does start, be one less thing. Um, so there is there is a little bit of work going on, but as far as kicking off the main project, um, that's going to wait. The, the the project participants will probably have a much more informed update in a sure March meeting because the project participants will have that conversation at the March uh, participants meeting uh, about how they want to react to the appeal. And um, you know, again, I say most likely it'll it'll be you know we will not move forward issuing a contract, but um, until then, uh, what's it costing us? Um, you know, it, uh, it 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 we will cost um, uh, a significant amount of money each month um, to to postpone for approximately another year. Um, we don't know what that is. The the we do know. Um, the numbers we've got right now um, had a May uh, start of construction. So we know what it is till May, but uh, to postpone it for approximately another month, that um, conversation and negotiation will start with a contractor uh, and, and should hopefully have that information before too long. Certainly wanna, wanna keep that going and, and wanna keep that contractor um, uh, engaged. Um, the final thing is just to give you a quick heads up, um, probably at the March meeting. So, so when we entered into the allotment contracts last fall, it was expected that we would about now, <laughs> fairly soon, be making for Longmont a $49 million payment. The other participants, their proportionate shares that the money for the project would come in within the next month or two or three. Um, that's not obviously not gonna happen now, but the project still has considerable ongoing costs. Uh, one is the, uh, many of the environmental mitigation costs were triggered by issuance of the permit. And so those things are going on and, and um, th that activity is happening. Um, we've not pulled back on the Colorado River connectivity channel yet. That may still have to happen. Um, we would hope it wouldn't, but there's there's some costs there that um, if we keep going with that project, you'll continue to have costs there. The reason we aren't stopping that right now is because there's a good portion of the funding for that project was a, gra a grant from the uh, Natural Resources Conservation Service. That grant has a had a deadline that expired and got renewed, got extended, and is yet yet to expire. Uh, and if we were to postpone the project, we'd lose a third the funding of the project. So um, it, it's critical to move that forward. Also, you know, um, if this delay postpones it too long, you could. You could lose one of the great, you know, one of the real benefits to the environment on the west slope is that connectivity channel, and so um, how that happens. All of what I, I guess um, for, for what I'm trying to tell you is is that there are ongoing costs that will need to be paid, and so the um, project uh, Northern Colorado Water Conservancy District Subdistrict uh, will will come back to the participants to ask for a partial, um, our LAMA contract doesn't allow for payment for just part of the project. It, it contemplated payment for the whole project. So we'll be coming back probably in March or April, probably March, um, ask 
to, to amend the contract to allow um, us to pay for, for the first probably around $10 million. Um, and Longmont's will of course be uh, 75, 90 of that 10 million. That's for the 10 million for the whole project to allow us to pay earlier than for the whole project for that amount. Um, right now, um, it's not contemplated that that will increase the total amount that we'll pay, that that will come out of uh, contingency funding and some of it like the connectivity channel and a lot of the environmental um, mitigation work was already contemplated and is already funded. So right now, um, we don't know. Once the negotiations with the contractor are done, then we'll know if the total project might have to go up a little bit. But we don't know that yet. We just know that right now we need to get some of the, some of the 49 million that Longmont um, contracted for, um, about a million of that would come from us. And we need to get that amount of money up to Northern sooner than we would for the rest of it. Um, and the rest of it will come at, at a later date, which again is not determined. So just wanted to give you that heads up that that'll be coming um, next month. Um, and then one real quick update, uh, similar to Windy Gap is that um, Northern uh, has been very uh, proactively and hard at work on the uh, fire recovery efforts for the West Slope uh, from the East Troublesome Fire. Um, right now they're working at infrastructure protection, i.e. looking at Willow Creek Reservoir uh, impacts to it, uh, Granby. They're, they're looking at some uh, debris booms, both around the Adams Tunnel inlet, a little bit of some possible debris booms in Shadow Mountain and then in Willow Creek. Um, and then we're also gonna be having some conversations about how to operate the project, though that's yet to come. But just real briefly to let you know, Northern is working very hard at um, looking at the uh, recovery efforts that need to happen on the West Slope and working uh, hand in hand with Grand County because Grand County just doesn't have the wherewithal to, to deal with the severity and the, the full scope. And they're looking at um, a fairly large emergency watershed protection gr uh, grant, which requires 25% match um, with Grand County and, and as well as other things that can be done on the West Slope. So uh, still a long ways to go on that, but um, they are working on that. And uh, uh, operationally, it will, it will change a little bit what what happens with the CBT system. But everybody's looking as hard as they can to try to protect our water supplies, um, West Slope water supplies as much as we can. So that's all uh, I had, um, Mr. Chairman, if I'd be happy to answer any questions, if there are any. I think Marsha has her virtual hand up. So um, did you have a question, Marsha? Yes, I do. Um, thanks, Todd. Um, I just wanted to know, I. Uh, and after I put my hand up, Ken said it's on the order of a million dollars uh, for transitional funding since uh, the start of the project is delayed again, and it's going to come to the water board next month. Do you have any um, expectation that, that it, it'll be any less than the month or a few weeks after that that it comes before the council? Um, or, uh, you know, what should I tell people to expect? Um, well, the, the earliest we'd be able to get it is the, uh, I think it's around the 30th of March. Um, mm -hmm. it, it more than likely will be in April. And that, that depends on whether any decisions are made at the March Windy Gap participants meeting. If though that the participants have to make their decision on whether to go forward right away, which then if they don't make that in March, then they'll make it in April and it'll, it'll be a month after that. But yeah, I would, I would, I would expect it wouldn't be, um, it'll, it'll, it would not surprise me that that decision will be made at the March participants meeting, which would then mean the March water board meeting and either the last regular meeting in 
March for council or the first regular meeting in April for council. Depending on, yeah, okay. we'd have a contract that I, I need to get through our legal department to review and give them sufficient time. Right, and that's pretty much as fast as it could happen, right? That's as fast as it could happen, yeah. yeah. Okay, great, thank you. Any other questions for Ken on the Windy Gap update? I'm not seeing any. Okay, thank you, Ken. Next item is 9B, the monthly legislative report. Looks like you're up again, Ken. Yes. Um, uh, since the legislature recessed and just recently <laughs> um, sat again, they have introduced a couple water bills, and we will get those water bills to you to review. But um, it's um, we haven't had time to even really hardly look at them ourselves, as well as um, uh, because everything got loaded on the legislature all at once. I'm, I'm thinking that they're not going to be able to move too quickly. The one bill that I, I, I did want to highlight, um, not because it's ready to review or get or even have any input, but but it's a uh, I believe it, it's a bill that has um, a, a lot of a lot of people looking at it from both sides um, and and does impact Longmont. So I wanted to give you a heads up um, and we'll, we'll bring it to the March uh, water board meeting. Probably will be asking for a recommendation at that point. But basically it, it's what what is um, for lack of a better term, it's called the turn back um, bill. Um, uh, more recently in the last few years, um, there's kind of been a push um, on some water users, but also at the state level um, to see uh, more language in water rights decrees that um, prevent turn back of water on water that's changed out of a ditch um, but then not used out of the ditch by the, the shareholders that move it um, uh, to not allow that to be turned back into the ditch and used by the other shareholders. And there's a whole bunch of levels of conversation around that. Um, the first one is, uh, so just generally, you know, when, when we transfer water out of a ditch, we're transferring our proportionate share of the ditch. Um, and then when we transfer it, there's a whole bunch of uh, controls on what we can do. One of them is we can't go beyond the historical use of the water. Um, so we are left with, um, in the decree, we're given um, very specific, uh, volumetric limits, uh, limits on times when we can divert, when we can't divert, um, all kinds of limits that protect both the creek and the other water users in the ditch. Uh, so in the past, when, in the past when, when you use that water outside the ditch, then the remaining shareholders got to use that portion that wasn't changed. But in the past, many times, uh, say Longmont would has decides, oh, we don't want to use the Longmont supply ditch this month because we have other water rights we're going to use. Then, then that water could be used uh, by the other shareholders because it wasn't being used for the change operation. Uh, so uh, there, and there's a couple things that of concern that's that's happened. One is there's a concern that if we meet our volumetric limit, and then it goes back in the ditch and others use it, is that an injury because you've expanded the use of that water right? That's one issue. And the courts have been just recently had a court case that allowed that that specifically said that can't happen once you've reached your volumetric limit. Of more concern is what happens when we don't, when the, the, the changed water right doesn't use its, its full allotment, but hasn't met its volumetric limit, do you want to uh, 
cut back on the other shareholders' ability to use it. And the theory is that in, in a generally in a, in a ditch, an irrigation ditch, the decree is pulled and then, especially many ditches, you one third of the shareholders will use all the decree and then it'll go to the next third and then the next third because there isn't enough water to give every single shareholder um, a proportionate share. And so that's kind of a rotating basis many ditches do and you, you, you got to do that to, to make the ditch work. Um, and so the courts have kind of held that if the ditch, and it's a real fact specific thing, the ditches. So, so there's a lot of, um, so there's a lot of unknowns right now, that whole area of turn back and what can turn back when you can't turn back. Quite honestly, in a lot of long much decrees, um, once we pull, once we pull the water out, we, it can't go back in anyway. So it's not quite as big a deal for Longmont because of a lot of our decrees. We have to say at the start of the year, we're gonna either allow this to be used for irrigation or we're gonna allow it to be used for change use, but we can't go back and forth. Um, but um, on the other hand, some of our ditches, um, we, we use some of the changed water outside the ditch and we use some of the changed water left in the ditch, say to irrigate a city park. So then, we want to make sure that we can irrigate the city park. So there's there's a lot of uh, this is an issue I think has enormous uh, potential to 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 take a long time to figure out, <laughs> and I'm really not sure where this bill is going to go. I can tell you right now, um, it the um, Colorado Water Conservation Board's State Affairs Committee, which does look at a lot of the water bills so, so that they can be worked out, kind of the de technical details can be worked out. They are currently meeting, they met last week and changed a lot of the language from the bill that you're looking at right now. They changed some of that language and they're meeting again this week, I think Wednesday or Thursday, and it'll change a little bit more. So certainly what you have in front of you is not gonna be what the final bill will look like anyway. And uh, you still got to get a sponsor in the Senate, but um, it's a it's a big deal. I, th I think in in my mind, it's one of the bigger issues in front of uh, the in front of the legislature in terms of water rights. And I hope everybody that looks at it can. I hope we get it right. Um, it's it's going to take a little bit of effort, and and the courts right now the courts are gonna, are having to come up with their their decisions because there isn't a lot of legislative <laughs> guidance. Um, and I'm, I'm sure there are a lot of people out there that understand it even a lot better than I do, but I wanted to give you that heads up that uh, this is probably one that we're gonna be looking at pretty hard and trying to figure out what, what best to do with it. So um, I'll, I'll leave it at that. I, I, I don't know that I'd be able to answer a lot of questions on it because there's still a, still a lot of unanswered questions, but... Um, be happy to answer any that I might be able to. <laughs> Allison. Yeah, thanks, Ken. I was just wondering if uh, there had been any discussions among other municipalities on this bill, and if anybody had taken a position at this point. Um, there, there will be. Um, it, most of the municipalities are are still looking at it, and I've. I've talked with a couple of my compatriots, but I don't have anything from any of the other participants yet. Um, it's it's entirely possible that it might even, it'll probably be brought up at the windy at the windy gap participants meeting, where a lot of the municipal uh, entities sit, and um, a lot of times that's where I can get kind of some input from other cities. So if I do get some input from those cities, then or any other time, yeah, I'll pass that on. To the board as well, but I don't have any right now. Just, I guess, one update on that. I, I know the Northern District, um, you know, is monitoring that as well. And I think the point is, is just as Ken said, it's kind of in flux. So waiting to get maybe more clarity on the, the wording of the proposed bill before anybody can take a, a stance on it. But anyway, Northern's looking at it pretty hard as well, as you can imagine. So any other questions, comments for Ken? 
I don't see any. Ken, is that the so is that the only one you wanted to bring up um, with regards yeah. to the leg legislative report? Okay. Yeah, that's that's the only one we've really had time. I, I knew how big that one was, so I wanted to make sure we okay. took a look at it. But the others we haven't had time to review. Okay. Go ahead, Scott. You had some. Yeah, sorry, Todd. I'm not sure where this best fits on the agenda, but it derives from legislation that was passed several years ago. And I just thought I'd ask Ken if uh, he has any information uh, on this topic. It has to do with the revision of the 811 program. And that revision that was legislatively approved uh, went into effect January 1st. And, and that does affect infrastructure that's underground and the need to um, the owners of property with underground infrastructure needing to do a certain number of, uh, of things in order to be in compliance with the uh, statute. Um, Ken, I, I have had some conversations on behalf of some ditch company clients uh, with the city of Boulder and the city of Boulder is uh, investigating potentially taking charge of all of the locates for underground infrastructure and public right of ways within the city limits. And I just don't know if Longmont has a, a, a program that it's looking at, thinking about, or has been in consultation with other municipalities that would be similar or, or how the city is approaching 811 locates within its uh, city jurisdiction. Um, yeah, that, that's a great question, Scott. Um, we, we have... We have done some locates um, within the city limits on um, in, in real select cases on some of the ditches, specifically, I think Longmont Supply and a couple others. Um, quite honestly, unfortunately, a lot of the ditch, a lot of the private ditch companies facilities are not locatable. <laughs> um, and so we're having conversations um, amongst the local ditch companies in Longmont. Um, we don't think, um, we, we haven't been able to work out a locate service internal to the city yet. Um, I would certainly hope that we can work something out in that arena. Um, we have informed the companies the, of the uh, pretty significant penalty if you don't play that game. Um, uh, uh, a lot of people don't, it, it, it's like a $50,000 fine if you don't play the game. <laughs> and and that's, that comes as a shock to many of the ditch companies, uh, you know, um, but, but it, it, it's what, it's, it's the legislation that was passed. Um, ironically, I know of a private, private uh, uh, HOA that has some raw water irrigation in its subdivision, one I live in. <laughs> and I've told them twice, it's a, the, the size of that fine and I can't get it through them. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, uh, it, it's a real unfunded mandate out there that, uh, that, that is hitting everybody, um, you know, we're trying to, I agree with you, Scott, we're trying to figure out with the ditch companies, for one thing that most of the ditch companies have part-time ditch riders, so you don't even have anybody to locate it. And um, we've even considered things as far as saying, can we go back to the legislature and say, if it's a road culvert and the contractor can look on one side of the road and see it and look on the other side of the road and see it. Why do you have to locate it? But, <laughs> but you do, you know, uh, 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 you know, the, and so, yeah, we're looking at everything from possibly doing permanent marking of some of the, of the ditches um, that doesn't help the private HOAs and, you know, it's amazing how many HOAs out there have some infrastructure buried underground. I don't, I don't think, you know, the folks that wrote that bill, he thought about that, but it's, it's a big deal. So, yeah, I apologize, Scott. We don't have any, any answer yet, but we, we are looking at, at, at that and, and uh, 
uh, I don't know, I'd even let Kevin throw in uh, anything more. He's He's been helping us look at that quite a bit too. Um, but yeah, we're, we're still working on that one. <laughs> yeah, Scott, <clears throat> we're uh, a few of the ditch companies are uh, looking at uh, getting a private locating service to do their locates. So um, I was working with uh, the Denial Taylor today, um, trying to get <clears throat> there's a contract with a private locating service um, up and running. So, you know, short of that, the problem we have, like Ken said, is there's just, you know, the ditch riders work only part-time part of the year and the 811 system requires somebody to be available 24 seven. So, that's why we kind of went with a private locating service. We're going to try it with the mill ditch. Um, that one's, there's a pretty extensive amount of underground uh, infrastructure with the mill ditch. I'm going to try it with that one and then kind of move on from there. So. Um, well, Kevin, if you wouldn't mind keeping us posted, um, I, I, I have ditch company clients similarly looking at private services um, as a way of at least limiting the potential liability. Uh, certainly there'll be a higher cost and that's hard to swallow for relatively lean operations that ditch companies generally run. Um, but I, I do know that, like I said, Boulder is contemplating something. I'm told Lafayette has something similar where at least within the city limits, there's some, some uh, assistance that potentially is forthcoming. And I, I'm not asking for it. I'm just curious if you guys come to that conclusion or if you're talking with other municipalities, that would be nice to know. You know, that the one thing that's obvious is that because it started January 1st, I doubt that anybody's got any invoices yet <laughs> to, uh, <laughs> to give them any sticker shock, frankly, uh, at the cost of locates, right? So, um, yeah, I was just, I'm, I'm going to be interested in how this unrolls because I think, Ken, your, your suggestion that corrective legislation is perhaps in, in, in um, something on the horizon. I've talked with several groups about looking at something in 2022, because I don't think 2021, we're going to have enough data to really prove a point, but I think 2022 will be ripe for that. And I just wanted to make sure we collaboratively thought about that. Cause I think there's a lot of uh, dormant issues that will arise that weren't intended by the bill. And yeah, Th thanks for your time. I appreciate that. Right. And Scott, I just got one comment to make um, Kevin and I on the boards that we serve on, we, uh, most of them we have been, bring it up because it's annual 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 meeting time this the, right now january january february march and so when it's we've been bringing it up with the at most of the meetings roger did you have a question or comment yeah scott did you mention the city of boulders planning on doing all locates under their jurisdiction like power and telecommunication locates or, or how far are they looking at going? And that's a good question, Roger. I'm not sure I know the answer. Um, I, I was having a conversation with one of the city attorneys about the ability for the city uh, or the city's desire potentially to at least help ditch companies. And similar to Longmont, they sit on a lot of boards. They own a lot of ditch shares within um, with ditch companies that uh, exist within the city boundaries. So <clears throat> they were only looking at those um, infrastructural elements that were within city right of ways. So it was fairly limited, but I don't know what the scope of that was, if it was solely ditch infrastructure, whether that dealt with other um, utilities as well. I, I just don't know. I can try to find out and, and circle back, Roger. I just, I don't have any better information at this point. I think that would be a real uh, bad decision to mess with something that works well now, particularly power locates and telecommunicate. Why would you, you know, I, I just don't understand why would you try and fix something that's not broken? So I was just kind of curious. And yeah, maybe they're I'm not planning on going that direction. I'm, I'm not sure they are. Like I said, it was specifically in the context of ditch infrastructure. And again, um, as Ken mentioned, yeah, if you can see a culvert on both sides of a, you know, a covered road, shouldn't have to go out and locate it necessarily. But um, most of the power companies and the telecom companies have people 24 seven available. Ditch companies just don't. And frankly, they yeah. don't have any budget for, for the increased um, 
uh, expenditure of, of doing that. I mean, if you don't narrow your buffer on, on the locates, you're looking at a fairly uh, big amount of locates that aren't anywhere near your ditch, but you get called on anyways and have to be responsive to and, and have to be responsive to almost immediately. It's a pretty draconian yeah. bill uh, on that element. So. All right. Thanks. Yeah, in, in, in practice, we find basically the call out service, they're not going to put themselves at risk at all. So it's practically if the call for locates within the same quarter section, it might be a couple thousand feet away, you'll still get called and you still got to pay for that locate. And it, it adds up pretty quickly. It's a lot of locates real quick. One nice thing about their new system is they are accepting our uh, GIS shape files so we can actually send them um, uh, the actual map of the ditch and then um, they're, they're, they're saying their their call outs are within 40 feet but we'll see how that actually plays out that would help okay any other questions comments <clears throat> All right, we'll keep moving on. Um, the next item is the um, uh, water resource engineering projects update. And Jason, are you out there? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Hey, everybody, it's Jason Elkins. Just wanted to give you a quick update on a couple of our capital projects. Uh, as you might recall, Button Rock Outlet has been torn apart for the better part of a couple months now, getting repaired. Um, we are going to, we're actually starting assembly of the gate today and installation of the gate uh, begins tomorrow. So um, I went down to Coblaco on, um, on Friday and did a final inspection of all the gate components and the coatings and everything to make sure it was ready for assembly. And so now AMS is starting to assemble it in their yard and then they're gonna transport that up there uh, via trailer and start uh, assembly uh, tomorrow. So. Right now, we're scheduled to have um, the outlet uh, back in operation by March 5th. And right now, I don't foresee any issues uh, to, to delay that. But if something comes up, I'll, I'll be sure to update the board. But as of right now, we're expecting the first week of March to have it back into service. Um, the South St. Vrain pipeline, as you, as you also might recall, we're, we're installing a pump station that will connect the South St. Vrain pipeline into the North St. Brain Pipeline. And we have Burns McDonald who is doing the design on that. And so we've completed our 30% design and we've actually um, submitted an RFP for um, the actual pump station, the purchase of the equipment. Um, just to remind the board that we're using leftover FEMA PAP funding from the 2013 flood recovery projects. We have about $900,000 and so We've, we've asked FEMA, can we use that money to purchase equipment? And so the, the purchase of this pump station, um, we did open up bids. I, I, I can't disclose who the lowest bidder is right now because we're still vetting them, but we're going to be able to purchase all that equipment um, with the available, the, the FEMA PAP funds. So um, right now we're, we're looking really good. Um, we're planning on having the pump station should be fully constructed by the end of the year and hopefully um, within op op operating within the first uh, quarter of next year. And that, that will be dependent on a lot of things. We might get the pump station done before we get the South St. Green Pipeline rehab project done. I, I don't think that'll be the case, but you know, um, can't turn the pump station on if we can't get water to the pump station. So. And that's that's really it. Does anybody have any specific questions? Any questions for Jason? I am not seeing any. Um, thank you for the update, Jason. I guess one question. So you guys are using temporary pumps on the um, <clears throat> on the Button Rock um, Dam to pump water out. Is that correct in the interim? And I assume mm -hmm. you have those. I think Ken was saying you had enough buffer in that that that'll allow for that March 5th time frame is that right yeah so we we originally 
um, was just allowing it to naturally spill over the spillway. And so just whatever the in, in stream flows was, was what was going over. Um, but because uh, Northern had to make repairs and basically turn off one of our water supplies, we had to install some pumps to make up for that loss. Um, and so we installed two pumps and pumped 15 CFS over the spillway. And we had to do that for three, three whole days. And then we, we, we turned one of the pumps off and then we turned the other pump down to about four CFS so that the um, in-stream flows could then slowly refill the reservoir and then naturally start spilling over. And so now it, it's back to spilling over as it was before. Northern turned the water back on. We're, we're back and you know at full running at full capacity, and uh, the pumps have been demobilized. Um, one thing to note, I am writing an SOP on, on the pumping uh, for, for emergencies like this, just so for future reference, we have um, some documentation that shows how it was done. Great, thanks, Jason. Any other questions, comments? I don't see any. Okay, we'll keep moving on. Um, next item is 9D is the Button Rock Preserve Management Plan update. Is um, Danielle, Going to give us some updates. She wasn't um, able to make it today, uh, Mr. Chair. So I'll I'll go ahead and just give you a quick update. Um, uh, that project is still continuing. Um, we were not able to get enough um, of the work done <laughs> to to bring that uh, project forward um, in the early spring this year. So it'll be a little bit later in um, probably into summer before we bring that, uh, that report, uh, that ma uh, master plan before you. Um, one reason we wanted to bring it up today was just to kind of give you a heads up. We, there, there had been talk about um, possibly uh, as part of that process, looking at eliminating um, fishing permits in Button Rock and just allow it to be uh, the same as the stream above and below, just you'd fish in it with a state fishing license only. Um, wasn't, we, we've not been able to get enough um, directed input to, to move that one forward. And, and actually it was, we weren't able to get it in time to get it in the state's fishing brochure. <laughs> so the 21 fishing brochure is already out saying you gotta have permits in Button Rock this year. So we've, we are gonna go ahead and continue this summer to have fishing permits. Um, but we will come before the board and ask that question um, probably late spring, early summer uh, about the future of that permit program, whether to keep it or eliminate it. Um, uh, but it won't, it won't be for this summer. So mostly that's probably the biggest thing we wanted to do is let the board know that um, we'll continue with the fishing permit program as we've had it for the last 25 years uh, for at least this summer, and then we'll explore that uh, in that uh, master planning effort um, later this spring and summer. Thank you. Okay, any questions? Okay, thank you, Ken. Um, next, Wes, you're gonna give the monthly water supply update. Yes, Mr. Chair. Um, so um, this month, I just wanted to, highlight a few of the uh, uh, changes on our water supply and, and drought indicators and go over a couple graphs. Next month, we will, because we're going to be returning in a relatively shorter period of time in three weeks, um, that will be when we really kind of have some real strong uh, meat in what we're talking about. But nonetheless, um, a couple things I wanted to mention at the beginning, and Nelson has already uh, touched on a few of those. Um, the uh, as we look at some of our our uh, water supply and drought indicators, flows are pretty much staying consistent throughout the winter time. The local uh, select storage is uh, near average, a little bit below average, but near average. We were actually in, I was in a part of a. Uh, uh, meeting with um, a number of entities stretching from Pueblo down to or all the way up to Fort Collins 
and it's a fair it's a fairly common um, situation for most of us of the uh, water providers and and um, uh, cities in that we're all right now um, feeling like we've got uh, good storage. Um, they're slightly below average, but um, municipalities and water providers oftentimes will take a more conservative approach in what they believe their, uh, their needs are going to be. And that's certainly the case with Longmont. Um, what in our select storage, we find that we have more storage up high. Some of that was a, a function of the uh, Button Rock Outlet Works uh, um, project we had going on that Jason just spoke to. So Button Rock is full, although Union is down more and Pleasant Valley's down a little bit. I think we're at about 40% full, but we, uh, we're still anticipating that that'll be near full by the runoff. Our uh, trans basin storages will, haven't changed since the last time we spoke and uh, really won't until Northern uh, speaks to the supplemental quota that they'll put out in, uh, in April or May. Um, and then South Platte water uh, uh, snowpack, Nelson mentioned that they were, that we were at about 92%. If you actually look down towards the um, kind of more St. Vrain specific, we're a little bit um, weaker on our snowpack. Uh, just kind of looking at a few of the, the sites that are more specific to our drainage probably puts us closer to about 80% right now. Uh, with the Colorado, although it's at about 88%, if you looked at the Windy Gap storage, uh, kind of in the Willow, Willow Creek area, it's closer to 96%. So um, there's, there's uh, we, we're kind of paying attention to that. And so, Heather, if you wanted to jump to page 30 for us, um, what you'll see there is some of the specific elevations. I've been bringing that to you the last several months. Uh, this just kind of uh, shows everyone once again that our total in the in the district in our storage is at 71 percent and normally it's probably in the mid 70s to upper 70s but a bulk of that is coming through the highland system and they're the they're they'll be the ones that are always down they're about 50 percent on their system so nothing real uh, surprising there um, and then if we wanted Heather to jump down to uh, page 38, I just wanted to kind of go over, this is a part of a graph on page, um, actually 39, I'm, I'm sorry, Heather. Um, it's kind of a, a difficult one to read. Um, you can kind of find it in your packet, but this is one that we pay attention to now, you'll have to bear in mind that this was as of February 1st, but it is the most recent one we have through NRCS that they've given us. And what it's telling us is that, um, uh, I guess it actually be the next, next page forward for Longmont. I'm sorry, Heather, thank you. That we're probably looking at about, well, as of February 1st, they're pre predicting about a 70% of average runoff for Lions, which goes hand in hand with the snowpack. Um, February 1st, no, we, we had a lower snowpack. Now we're in the upper 80s. So I'm guessing, depending on what happens in the next week, that when we get the March 1st reading, we'll find that bumped back up to maybe those uh, around 80, 80 to 85%. So uh, we'll report that next month to the board. Um, on page 42, what I wanted to highlight on, on these graphs, um, South Platte, you can see we're kind of tracking along average, albeit um, below average. But what we really see is, and it's, it's um, more often than not, we'll have a, uh, a snow event, maybe sometime mid-December, end of December that gives us a bump. Then we've more frequently seen it towards February, where you get that bump, and then again, um, mid-March. And so it's um, what it begins to show us is that even though we are currently in the South Platte Basin 
right around eight to nine inches where our normal peak would be at about 15 inches. So we're about halfway there. Um, this last bit of snowpack that we get often comes in the form of one or two snow events, those wet snow events in the spring. And so uh, we're all crossing our fingers and hoping that we'll, we will see those. And so between that graph and uh, the, the last graph on the following page for the Colorado River, you find how significant some of those storms can, can be. You'll see those sharp increases in different time periods where it's made those jumps. So uh, again, we'll be coming in front of the board on the uh, 15th of March. And at that time, I think we're going to have, we'll be able to have a much more uh, in-depth conversation about where we set. I'd say right now though, we're, um, we're optimistically um, hopeful <laughs> that we're going to have a, hopefully a, a decent runoff. Another thing that was discussed in this meeting that I had with some of these other entities, um, and it seems to be fairly statewide, is the recognition for the low soil moisture and how it will probably take a uh, above average snowpack to yield an average runoff. And so I think that's true with us as well. So um, we'll just have to stay tuned. So at that, I'll be happy to answer any questions that the board may have. Are there any questions for Wes on his report? Um, Wes, I, I do have one question. You had mentioned in your write-up that um, the Pleasant Valley Reservoir, we're just saying if it doesn't fill, um, there may be a limited water supply under the rough and ready system. Mm -hmm. um, in particular, I guess what I'm curious about is you've got the U Creek Golf Course, um, the rough and ready park, Stephen Day Park, and Spring Gulch, number two. What, what would the city do in terms of irrigation supply if you don't have, um, you know, if those don't, you don't have enough water out of Pleasant Valley to irrigate, is that a, would they reduce their demand per se, or is there other supplies that you would then supply? I'm just kind of curious what, what the plan would be since I got brought up in the write-up. Yeah. So, um, so for a lot of those parks, golf courses, uh, green spaces, east of town, we really think about them being um, irrigated with three sources, the rough and ready and that direct flow component. So depending upon the runoff regime, we'll find out how long that stays in priority to irrigate under that. After that goes out of priority, we would then jump to Pleasant Valley. Um, and then if and when the Pleasant Valley decree is no longer to yield enough for that water, Longmont would likely um, dedicate some of its CBT supplies to those purposes. So the, the simple answer is we'd probably supplement it with CBT. Um, we have um, our high mountain dam decrees that are eligible to be stored in Pleasant Valley. So depending upon the call in the river, when the runoff occurs, uh, we may be able to put those in there to help fill up our part of the uh, Pleasant Valley Reservoir that we would need for the city purposes. Um, there's, there's, a, there's a number of different factors um, that'll be involved, but I think where Longmont would likely, and, it, and that would kind of depend also upon the quota declaration from Northern, if uh, our first priority will be to be providing uh, and meeting the needs of our domestic users, our treated water users, and uh, to the extent that we feel comfortable that we can do that, then we would uh, free up probably those CBT supplies as needed. But if it was very dry and uh, Pleasant Valley was down, they would have to further reduce what they normally would do. And one last thing to remember is that Longmont's use under that reservoir is a proportion to our to our interest in the company is is very small mm -hmm. um there's a lot of other users out there that have actually benefited from the fact that you know we don't have that much irrigated area under the pleasant valley reservoir compared to our total share ownership uh and basically um we'll probably you know we should do fairly good because we don't have a huge area to irrigate compared to to our our interest of 
of what water we do have in there. Um, other water, other water users that pull water out of that will have to, will, you know, they'll have to watch their hole much closer than in years when that reservoir is full. Thank you guys. Any other questions, comments on the water status report? Okay, I don't see any, we'll keep moving on. Item number 10A is a review of the water board bylaws and guiding water principles. Ken, are you gonna take that one? Yeah, um, we, we have before you, we think we made the changes that the board approved of last month. So hopefully you had a chance to look at those and, and make sure you're okay with that. The one um, conversation we had surrounded um, remote meeting attendance. Um, and as it turns out, the city does have some policies around remote attendance. Um, the city's kind of policy is that you, you only, we can only allow um, remote attendance during emergency um, situations. So certainly COVID has been a year long emergency, but um, that's why we're doing remote meetings right now. But um, generally the city's policy is not to do remote attendance. So we did not change the language uh, concerning remote attendance in the bylaws. We, that remains we're basically silent on it, but that's not changed in the, um, there's, there's not specific statutory language that I can point to um, prohibiting that in an, under a non-emergency situation, but um, it, generally it's, it's um, currently not, not, uh, not allowed in Longmont, <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll put it that way. Um, mostly be more from a policy standpoint that is going to be reviewed. I think by the by the time we all go back to in person meetings, sometime this year, whenever that'll be, um, then after this experience, all the boards have been doing remote as well as council. Um, then I think we'll probably have that conversation, and it'll be a more robust citywide conversation. So. Um, if that can happen and, and, it, and, and it may, then it would probably be appropriate next January. We, we look at the bylaw, the water board looks at the bylaws every January. We think next January would be a good time to look at that particular issue uh, and address it then. So if the board is okay with that, I think the rest of the changes, um, I believe we captured what water board um, had asked for and, and would be ready to move that, um, but the bylaws forward. So in terms of moving it forward, do you need a, is this just a approval? Do you need a motion and um, a second on that, Ken, to approve the changes as you drafted them? Um, you know, it, it might be good to go ahead and, and you really approved them last month, but it, it, might, not, it might not be bad just to, now that you've seen the changes in, in black and white <laughs> and red, okay. Uh, okay. be good to approve it as written. Okay, um, I guess before we do that, does anybody have any questions or comments on the edits and Ken's explanation of that? Okay, if not, um, we need a motion to um, approve the water board bylaws um, as they were included in the water board packet. Kathy is making the motion. Yes. Is there a second? Roger is making a second. Um, any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, that motion carries. Um, the next item, um, let me switch over here, is the. Uh, um, yeah, go ahead, Roger. Could, could I make a comment on uh, the last part of this, the guiding water principles? I just have one thing I wanted to ask about. Um, I was reading through the annual water board report for 2020, which I thought was done very well. But when you get into um, looking at sustainability 
update, there was a paragraph in there that said that uh, we were looking at water use per capita per day in Longmont service area from 26, 2006, 2019. Uh, and I was wondering, Ken, did your people put those numbers together on, on per capita water use over a period of time or who, who, who did the numbers for those? Um, we did, the staff did that in house, yes. And, and we try to keep that updated as, as time goes on. What, what I was wondering is if we could see the numbers, the raw numbers uh, for a five year period through 2020, just, just to look at the current look at them, I'd like to understand better what those numbers look like. So when we get into this discussion of sustainability, uh, I'd know what I'm talking about right now. I haven't, I haven't seen the raw numbers that I would like to, or I think it'd be good for the board to see them too. Yes, we'd be happy. We'll, we will bring that next month as just a general update to give you that information. And then we'll continue sure. to bring that to you. I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Roger. Um, the next item is the um, is 10B, review of major project listings and items tentatively scheduled for future board meetings. Is there anything, Ken, you guys want us to look at in that regard? I have nothing to update there. Okay. 10C is the annual water board report. Um, is there any, um, are you gonna give an overview of it, Ken, or um, you just want input from us after reviewing, reviewing it? I'll, I'll let Wes give you a quick um, summary of it. So, what the board has in front, as, as you um, all may recall, is there's a requirement, if you will, that each year you'll put together an annual report to produce to council. And so this is a summary of that report for, your, uh, for you guys. And so uh, there's, it looks strikingly similar to the years prior that we've had. It tries to capture all those major items that you, your board has uh, reviewed and the water issues that you've studied. Um, there's really nothing um, specific that I wanted to highlight. If there was questions or have you seen something that you thought might be an error or would like to change, um, we'd be happy to have that conversation. Otherwise, what we'd like to do is just have some direction to go ahead and forward this as your board's um, formal annual report to city council. Okay, is there any questions, comments on the annual report? I, I do have one, Wes. Um, under the cash in lieu of water rights, it has a, a little description in there that the fee is determined by the current market rate of senior basin water rights. When such information is available, and anyway, um, we can keep going through that, but that's really not um, what we're doing. We're setting it based on the Windy Gap um, firming project on a cost per acre foot yeah. of that. So I, I think that needs to be updated, um, that section, because it's not really reflecting what we're doing. So that, that was the only one I, I saw. Very good. Yeah, we'll, we'll make that correction. So it uh, mirrors what, we, what we're doing currently, what our practice was for last year. Absolutely. Thank you, Todd. Okay. Any other questions, comments? Um, do you want to, I guess, with that one change, maybe subject to that one change, um, would you like to get a, a motion, a formal approval by the board? If, if you would. Okay. Um, I guess with that one change um, being made, um, we need a, a motion and a second for approval of the um, annual report. I'd make that motion, Todd. This is Scott. Okay. We have a motion by Scott. Is there a second? I'll second. All right, a second by Allison. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, what uh, annual report is approved. Um, all right, let me back to my script here. Um, so the next item under 11 is informational items and water board correspondence. Um, it doesn't look like there was anything in there. Was there, Ken, any other items we need to discuss? 
We have none other. Okay. And then I guess item 12, we will be reviewing the cash and lieu um, next month, I believe. I guess the one note on that, Ken, would be um, if you can't get any, you know, indication of Windy Gap um, costs. I don't know if, you know, the, when they're doing updates of the overall project costs, especially given the delay by the, the um, uh, appeal to the lawsuit. I guess that would be, you know, something we would need to take into account as soon as it's available in relation to cash and loo. So, yeah, that may be available for your March meeting. Um, okay. Conversations are go ongoing with the contractor, but it may be June before we know for sure. Mm -hmm. We'll certainly bring any information we have by then to the March meeting. Okay. I think the only other item that we had talked about was maybe, you know, at some point here getting an update from St. Brandon Left Hand um, on the stream management plan that, that they were working on or the implementation of it, I should say. So. Yes, we've had those conversations with the St. Brain District and currently Sean is tentatively schedule, scheduling to come to your April board meeting to give you that update. Okay, great. That sounds good. Um, with that, any other items the board has? Um, I'm not seeing anything. With that, we're on to item 13. Um, well, any questions, comments, anything for the good of the order? I don't see any. So with that being said, I'll go ahead and adjourn the meeting. Thank you guys.